revered and respected by our ancestors for thousands of years, demonized and suppressed by the war on drugs, and now at the dawn of a new millennia, they are making their triumphant return. Scientists, researchers and patients alike are exploring these ancient therapies to heal modern ailments. And we're here to bring you the latest in scientific research, cutting-edge practices and first-hand experiences from those who have been transformed in body, mind and spirit by plant medicines from cannabis to psilocybin to ayahuasca and beyond. This is the Plant Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome to the next episode of the Plant Medicine Podcast. I'm Dr. Lynn Marie Morski, your guide on this journey. And today we have a very special episode. We are going to be talking about psychedelics and the science of connection with Dr. Julie Holland. And it is part one of a three-part trilogy of incredible episodes that Dr. Holland has been so generous to share with us. So If you are not familiar with her, Dr. Julie Holland is a psychiatrist specializing in psychopharmacology with a private practice in New York City. Her book, Weekends at Bellevue, chronicles her nine years running the psychiatric emergency room as an attending physician on the faculty of NYU School of Medicine. Frequently featured on the Today Show and CNN's documentary series, Weed, Holland is the editor of The Pot Book and Ecstasy, The Complete Guide. Both books are nonprofit projects that help to fund clinical therapeutic research. Dr. Holland is a medical monitor for several MAPS PTSD studies utilizing MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or testing strains of cannabis with varying CBD to THC ratios. She has worked for decades on U.S. drug policy reform based on harm reduction principles. Her 2016 book, Moody Bitches, The Truth About the Drugs You're Taking, The Sleep You're Missing, The Sex You're Not Having, and What's Really Making You Crazy, has been translated into 11 languages. Her most recent book, Good Chemistry, The Science of Connection from Soul to Psychedelics, was published in June 2020. Holland sits on the Scientific and Medical Advisory Board of several cannabis and psychedelic corporations. Now, if that bio doesn't say it all, ladies and gentlemen, this was a massive honor to have Dr. Holland come on and share with us these three topics. So the first topic we covered this week, like I said, is psychedelics and the science of connection. And then next week, we are talking specifically about psychedelics and tapering antidepressants. I've had many requests for that show. And then in the third episode, we're going to be talking about credentialing those who are doing psychedelic therapies and how to know that you are hopefully going with somebody who is well-trained in psychedelic therapy. And and as we move into this new world of psychedelics as medicine, how we can make sure that everybody is getting the psychedelics in the most safe way possible. Now, before we get to our first of the three incredible episodes, wanted to remind you that the Plant Medicine Podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. We will be talking about many medical subjects. However, nothing here is medical advice. And one more thing, if you are a clinician yourself or you know somebody who is a clinician who would like to learn more about psychedelics, please head over to psychedelicmedicineassociation.org where our mission at the Psychedelic Medicine Association is to provide you with everything you need to know so that you can help patients as we move into this new world with increasing access to psychedelic therapies that are proving to be much more efficacious than a lot of the things we've had at our disposal to treat patients with before. So again, to learn more about psychedelics from the clinician side, please head over to psychedelicmedicineassociation.org. And one last thing, as a side note, since we recorded all three of these episodes at one time, you will hear just awkward endings to episode one and two where I tried to sum it up, but then suddenly it's just like, thank you for listening to the Plant Medicine Podcast. Um, Do not be afraid. This is (laughs) all part of the plan. Just head on over to week two when it comes out and then week three when that comes out and trust me you will have an hour and a half of fantastic information from dr holland all right now without further ado thank you so much for joining us today dr holland thank you for having me i'm happy to be here well this this is an absolute treat i've had people specifically request to have you on and so i'm very grateful that you come on and we're going to talk about a number of subjects. In fact, this is going to be probably divided up into two or three episodes. So if anybody's listening to episode one, please stay tuned for weeks two and three of this. Um, Dr. Holland has written this amazing book called Good Chemistry, and she's discussing a lot of how neurochemistry affects us in our daily life and our interactions with ourselves and our community and our planet. 
And then there's a lot in that book about how psychedelics interact there as well. So Dr. Holland, I'd love to start with the chapter that I, that I got uh, um, the most out of was the connecting with self chapter. And mm -hmm. I love how you said that connecting with self is a prerequisite to connecting with others and how like you reminded us that the opposite of addiction is connection. And so I think a lot of what we're suffering from now, be it addictions or mental health, depression, et cetera, is from a lack of connection, obviously, especially with the pandemic. So if you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you brought up that are keeping us from being connected with ourselves, like you know, phones or hiding things from ourselves, that kind of thing. I think that'd be a great starting point so people can start recognizing how we might be hiding from ourselves and how that may have some repercussions in us trying to connect with others. Right. So, yeah, the first chapter of Good Chemistry is just focusing on this foundational idea that if you're not sort of in your body and embodied and feeling your feelings, um, you're not going to be much use to anybody else in a, in a relationship. So you have to know yourself and know what you're feeling before you can attempt to communicate it with somebody else and create a connection with somebody else. So the first chapter is really all about how do we connect with ourselves and how are all the different ways we go about it. Um, and the easiest thing is just to find all these examples of how we disconnect from ourselves, which, you know, pretty much most of the things we do every day, we're sort of disconnecting from our bodies. You know, as soon as I log into my laptop and I'm typing and my, my head sort of in the screen, I'm not very aware of my posture. I'm not aware of my breathing or anything like that. Or I may go hours working and I'm like, oh my gosh, I haven't eaten yet today, this kind of thing. So it's very easy for us to escape our bodies or escape the present moment right? We can get totally sucked into another world if we're watching like a scripted drama or something, and you're not in the present moment. So just just focusing on, you know, this uh, be here now and being present in the moment, that already goes quite a ways toward treating things like anxiety and depression and addiction. So a lot of the addictive sort of compulsive behaviors, uh, scratching these itches over and over again, uh, we wouldn't be so itchy <laughs> if we were more comfortable in our own bodies in the present moment. And I think what's happening now with, with the pandemic and the isolation because of the pandemic is that a lot of us are sort of soothing ourselves more than usual. You know, we are maybe uh, eating comfort foods more than we used to or smoking more pot or ha having more quarantinis or whatever it is we're doing um, because there is this sort of general state of unease because we are so disconnected from each other. So we owe it to ourselves. If we can't connect with other people during the pandemic, we have to at least really be on a good relationship and good terms with ourselves uh, and fully connected with ourselves. And that, that really is a way to bring down uh, anxiety and angst and this sort of feeling like you need something and you don't know what it is. And so you keep trying to plug the hole with various things that don't really work. you know. And uh, there's this great quote in Good Chemistry. It's not mine. I believe it's from Gabor Mate, but uh, I use it quite a few times in the book, which is, you can never get enough of something that almost works, you know? And so when we're eating, when we're drinking, when we're smoking, all these things that we're doing to sort of soothe ourselves, it doesn't fully work. It just almost works. And so we think that, you know, quantity can make up for quality. Um, but if we find ways to really center with ourselves and connect with ourselves, whether that's meditation or yoga, um, just anything that we can do to be grounded in our bodies and grounded in the present moment, that works better and you'll need less of it. Yeah, that makes total sense. And something that I that you had brought up is that there are certain chemicals, neurotransmitter, neurochemicals that are involved in addiction that so we may colloquially say, "Oh, I'm addicted to my phone or or I'm addicted to this or that." But you point out that there are actual chemical releases when we do certain activities like screen time, etc. And those are similar to the, the chemicals involved in addiction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think we kind of trivialize yeah. it, but there's a chemical basis. Well, there's, there's two issues coming up. I mean, you know, one, I will tell you a short little story about that. There was a particular time where I was like dealing with my phone and switching carriers and there was a problem and I ended up sort of, lo you know, lost between two carriers and uh, holding the phone in my hand and seeing that it has just become a completely worthless object. Um, and I felt something physiologically in that moment when I knew that I did not have a functional phone that reminded me 100% of a time that I had abruptly discontinued opiates after surgery. And I was like, I know this feeling. 
this is this is opiate withdrawal this feeling and i got it from my phone and i was like that's important <laughs> you yeah. know i was like wait a minute why do my knees feel kind of nauseous oh i know this feeling so i mean it really it really got me sort of going down this wormhole of like how addicted are we to our phones and what is the physiology but i think anybody here will tell you that like that split second where you think you've lost your phone or you've left it in the cab and you can't find it on your person that is not a comfortable feeling you know that is an acute anxiety sort of withdrawal uh abandonment sort of a feeling. Uh, and one of the things that I learned and tried to explain in Good Chemistry is that one of the reasons why opiates um, are so soothing is they really quell that, that unease and that anxiety, and they really mimic the chemistry and the physiology of what we feel when we are taken care of, held, um, attended to, um, and it's, you know, it's not a coincidence that as we had this sort of loneliness epidemic, which I always remind people, you know, we had two epidemics before this pandemic. And that's what, good you know, good chemistry was written before COVID. But it was all about these epidemics that we were having, which we still are having, which was an epidemic of loneliness and isolation and an epidemic of, of overdoses, basically. And those two things increasing are not coincidental. Although, you know, the other thing that was increasing was that there was a real glut of opiates and uh, a lot of people making money off their distribution. So it was a little bit of a perfect storm where people were isolated and feeling unease and there was a lot of pain medicines available. And, you know, the thing no doctor likes to admit is that the opiates don't just help to treat physical pain. They really help to treat psychic pain. They help to treat the pain of disconnection and that pain of isolation. So I'm not recommending to your readers that, that, uh, that they use opiates for that pain. I am recommending that they recognize the pain of disconnection, isolation, and that they treat it with connection, not with opiates. Yeah, absolutely. But connection, connection will sort of mimic the chemistry that you get um, from opiates and also from, from cannabis. You know, the oxytocin, which is the hormone that sort of enables us to trust and bond and connect, it gives us a tremendous amount of pleasure. But the way that oxytocin delivers the pleasure is through the endocannabinoid system and the endorphin system. So uh, it's a pretty heady cocktail, you know, and uh, when you feel sort of loved and held and, and soothed and cared for, your chemistry is sort of uh, optimized, you know, and that's really how the body is designed, right? We're, we're social primates, where humans are categorized as obligatorily gregarious, which means that we are obligated to be friendly and cooperate and collaborate. That is how we survive. You know, back on the savannah, if you were uh, ejected or ostracized from the group, you were going to die. And so on a very deep kind of primal level, when we feel that we are not uh, in a group cared for, that nobody has our back, um, that really puts us in, in an acute, sympathetic, fight or flight state. It's bad for our moods. It's bad for, you know, dare I or say, like our souls, but it's really bad for our bodies, the physiology of our bodies. Like we are not healthy when we are disconnected. It is a it's a pro-inflammatory state, right, when we're disconnected. And it is anti-inflammatory when we feel uh, cared for and, and like somebody's got our back and we feel safer. And does that apply both to the community, as you mentioned, at large, and also connection to ourselves? Yeah, well, you know, when I think of oxytocin, oh, you know, you asked me something I was supposed to circle back to about oxytocin. <laughs> well, um, you talked about like uh, sort of uh, drugs of abuse or addiction and, you know, being on our screens. And um, and I, I talked about this, you know, us being addicted to our screens. But the other thing that I will say is for those of us who are having sex with our computers, right? If you're masturbating and you're watching porn on your phone or on your laptop, the thing about an orgasm is that, that it reliably releases oxytocin because you're supposed to, uh, you know, the way the body was designed was before computers, basically. Uh, and when and when someone gives you an orgasm, like there's a certain amount of work or attention that goes into that. And so you uh, you trust them, you bond with them. Um, you know, you have this physiological response where you bond with the with the person that helped to put you in this state. So now we we're having an orgasm and we're having a release of oxytocin. And so my question is, 
are we bonding with our computers? Are we bonding with our phones? Like have our, have our laptops become our lovers because we are having an orgasm and oxytocin. So I don't, that is my question. I do not know the answer. Um, I'm afraid that the answer is yes. <laughs> I think that's very possible. You know, in, in Moody Bitches, I wrote quite a bit about, about masturbation with porn and how that sort of resets your threshold of what will arouse you. And that, you know, as you're sort of refining your searches for, for porn more and more, you are, you are sort of fetishizing the things that arouse you. And then when you go out into the real world, uh, you don't have as much control over the stimulus and it's different. You know, sex with a person is different than just watching uh, professionals do it, you know? <laughs> so, um, I mean, this, I think this is something that we're going to be talking about and learning about as the years go on, because uh, it's becoming more and more of an issue. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you just mentioned how, okay, are we having this oxytocin exchange with our phone? Do we get some of those dopamine? I know dopamine is very often involved in addictive behaviors. Yeah. Do we get some dopamine hits from the interactions that we have with our phones? Yeah. So, the you know, the way to really think about dopamine, because I think dopamine is sold as like the pleasure neurotransmitter. It's really not about pleasure. I would say that pleasure more comes from endorphins, endocannabinoids, where dopamine really comes in is more about paying attention. Is this important? Do I need to pursue this? You know, there's a word in neurology called salience, right? Which is like, what's important? What's not? What do you pay attention to? And dopamine is all about salience. And figuring out what's important. And then there's a little bit of like a chasing what's important. You know, I think of dopamine, I, you know, I, uh, in good chemistry, I talk a lot about you know, like yin and yang. I definitely think of dopamine as like a yang thing where you are like going out and chasing the wild boar because that's important. And you know, uh, the tribe needs food and you scan. And when you see the boar, the dopamine hits because it's like, yes, that's important. Go chase that thing. Um, and there's pleasure in pursuit, right? Obviously, we all have experienced the pleasure in pursuit. It's one of the reasons why video games are so reinforcing. So that's a bit of a dopamine situation also. Um, but like this, I, you know, I remember once seeing, like reading this, a woman who was writing about like, uh, if, you know, if I go buy a pair of shoes, then I get like the oxytocin dopamine combo pleasure. And I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know about that, you know? I mean, I don't think you can extrapolate it to everything, but, uh, you know, on the other hand though, you know, in the same way that we're sort of primed to, uh, hunt the wild boar, some of us are primed to forage, right. And to go out and gather, right. We're not hunters, but we're gatherers. Um, that also requires paying attention, knowing what's important, what's salient and following up, um, on those things. Yeah. Got it. Um, when we were talking about screens and talking about connection with self and others, I like this quote that you had in Good Chemistry where you referred to phones as distraction machi machines designed to keep us looking anywhere but inside ourselves. And yes. I think that's... I would still agree with the me that wrote that then. <laughs> Good. Yes. I'm glad. They are distraction machines. Um, among, among other things, though, right? Because they're also, they are the way that right now we are, you know, more than ever before... We are all on our devices because there's nobody around us and we're and we're more isolated. And so and they are now the way that we are primarily connecting with people. Right. And whether excuse me, whether that's like Zoom calls or, you know, FaceTime or whatever. So and um, there is an oxytocin researcher who thinks that um, human connections through a video screen, he thinks you still get about 70 percent of the oxytocin you would get face to face. I don't know how he comes up with that number. I emailed him and asked him and he didn't have a an answer that made me very happy, but, um, I'm, you know, he does measure oxytocin levels in people. And so I think it was an estimate, but so, you know, you can't say that, uh, you're not feeling any sense of connection through the screen, but I think we can all agree that we would be getting more, uh, you know, skin to skin, eye to eye, smelling somebody's pheromones, you know, reading their aura, if you believe in this sort of thing. I mean, everybody really does have a certain amount of like, electromagnetic, you know, frequency coming off their bodies. I mean, there's our, our chemistry is, is, is sort of chemical electric. So I think that people, uh, some people are more sensitive at sort of picking up on the cues of other people, but it's safe to say that you're not getting through a, through a screen, what you would be getting face to face. Um, Although a good connection helps, you know, there's nothing worse than like somebody with a herky jerky connection or their face is freezing, things like this. And when you're, 
when you're on a Zoom call with a lot of faces, there is a part of your brain that is constantly scanning for social cues to make sure that you're safe. Because it does get back to this sort of uh, Savannah idea, right? If you were going to get kicked out of the group, you you really may not survive, right? So anytime we're in a group situation, we do sort of scan for social cues and make sure that we're accepted by the group. So when you're on a call with like eight people and some of them are in a dark room and some of them have their cameras off and then other people, their faces are freezing or their cameras looking up at the ceiling and like your, your brain is constantly scanning for faces and for, for social cues from faces. So, um, it's exhausting. You know, my patients that are on like back to back zoom calls all day long, they're completely fried and they didn't really understand why am I so tired and all I've done is sit in a chair all day. But your brain uses a lot of energy and a lot of fuel. And that that scanning for social cues is like a background app that's always running. So it can really it can really drain the batteries. Yeah, that makes sense. And and I think this is a good time to point out that there's like you said, there are two different ways that we can be interacting with our phones. Are we interacting with our phones in a way that is trying to get some of that oxytocin like we are having chats with our friends, et cetera? Or are you using it as an agent of self-distraction? Like the second yeah. that that maybe some trauma comes up and I love that you said that you should crochet on a pillow everyone has childhood trauma like if you don't think you have trauma like just because you didn't have maybe capital T trauma you haven't been to war like yeah. there are traumas and there you know sometimes or maybe even just the thing you did yesterday that you wish you wouldn't have said to somebody the minute that that starts to bubble back up and you're about to go into that inward investigation you're like nope gotta grab and just scroll through Instagram so you're not actually right. doing it for connection you're doing it for distraction right. Yeah. And you and I think that's that's why the, the you who wrote, you know, designed to keep us from looking anywhere but ourselves. And I mean, I like I kind of there was like an amen moment for that because I see people do, you know, <laughs> right. I mean, no, not, everyone does. Yeah. That. I mean, you know, it's kind of sad when you see how much people are doing it. And, you know, uh, I'd be on the subway platform in the city and look around. Every single person is scrolling on their phone. Um you know, it's changed the quality of the city. There aren't there aren't as many sort of little, you know, conversations that have or anything like that. I mean, it's um, it's too bad, you know, that people are so sucked into their phones. And I really uh, I was I was really pushing for people to, like, close your laptop, put your phone down, go outside, go face to face, you know, hug people skin to skin, <laughs> breathe their pheromones. And then COVID hit. And I was like, OK, never mind. Do none of that. Uh, <laughs> do that later you can't do that now you know it was just like a, a lot of advice i was worried actually because it was like all of a sudden it dated the book you know because half the advice in the book was like yeah but you can't do that right now um on the other hand it's the book is timely for two reasons i mean you know it talks a lot about about social isolation and, and how damaging it is and um and it talks a lot about you know psychedelics and mdma which i hear are trending now i hear this is a very hot topic all of a sudden so <laughs> it's so you know it's nice when you've been talking about the same thing for like 30 something years and then everybody else is too i mean it's very gratifying actually i've been i've been enjoying this sort of phase of things you know there's a there's a real froth to how many companies are are forming and you know how many stocks are becoming available and things like that i mean it's you know I think about like the 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 green rush, you know, for medical cannabis and legal cannabis like that happened over a period of decades. But this this gold rush with the psychedelic industries is really happening over a period of like months or years. I mean, it's you know, it's so telescoped and intense, just as you would expect psychedelics to be. Right. Right. Like, what? Well, why would we want any less from them? But it's you know, it's, things are happening very, very quickly. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of sort of land grabs happening with, with IP and patent protection and stuff like that. That's very upsetting to me uh, and other people what's happening. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm anti-patent, but I am definitely anti, anti-competitive practices. You know, I think there's enough to go around. I think like a rising tide lifts all boats. And we don't have to have poverty mind. There's plenty of people that can be helped from these medicines. We are all traumatized. Every one of us. I mean, you, see, you know, this like idea that like every childhood has trauma. It's true. It's all relative, right? Some people have, you know, born with a silver spoon, whatever, a life of Riley, however you want to say it. It doesn't matter. At some point, uh, you know, your parents left you with a terrible babysitter or they left you alone or you thought they were never coming back. It, you know, it, it, there's always trauma. Um, and everybody sort of carries it around in their bodies to some extent, and it really needs to be unearthed and investigated for us to be healthier and happier. So everyone can avail themselves 
of MDMA assisted psychotherapy or psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. I mean, everyone with an asterisk, right? There's a few maybe uh, fragile populations that shouldn't dive in, but nearly everyone can benefit from an expert helping you uh, navigate this and having good preparatory sessions and having good integration afterwards. But like most people really can benefit from these therapies and I think that means that there's enough to go around and, you know, people don't have to be complete douchebags about how they behave with others. But, uh, you know, this is a, it's a big playing field. There's a lot of players coming on the scene and it's a little hard to figure out, you know, who's a good person and a bad person and, and why. Um, but, you know, hopefully there'll be a certain amount of like self-regulation in this field. I mean, this is something you and I have been talking about a little bit is, um, there needs to be some sort of, uh, quote, governing body, end quote, that can help sort of ensure uh, good good behavior and sort of weed out the bad behavior and, the and, you know, the people who are doing it wrong <laughs> by yeah. consensus. Yeah. Um, complicated issues that, that really need to be worked out over time. Yeah, absolutely. And we will get into a full discussion on that in a minute. Yeah. I, since you went into psychedelics, I wanted to... Uh, discuss how you mentioned in the book that so so say somebody is you know having trouble connecting with their selves that's very often uh, seemingly that they are kind of at a war with their own ego and what maybe some stories that they have that are ruminating and you pointed out that psychedelics help release the neuronal hold of certain structures associated with selfhood ego and identity would you mind talking a little bit about how yeah. psychedelics help in that in that arena so, I mean, this is, you know, what everybody's been talking about with this default mode network, right? There's like a certain neural circuitry that sort of assures you day to day that you are still you uh, and that all your stories and your history still holds. And whatever stories you say about yourself, uh, you know, I had a good childhood, I had a bad childhood, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, I'm a hard worker, I'm lazy, you know, whatever these things are, um, Part of it is just your own identity and your own hold on your ego. And then and then part of it is also kind of checking in on what your social status is. How am I doing? How did I do yesterday? How am I going to do tomorrow? Where am I socially? But, but this sort of rumination, who am I and how am I doing, um, it's a default pattern for all of us. You know, if you've got nothing better to do and you get to this sort of navel-gazing point, you end up in this... Uh, where am I at? How am I doing? Am I still who I thought I was? And and psychedelics really just kind of dissolve this loop. Um, they disconnect the loop from happening over and over. And two things happen. I mean, one is there's just this a quieting of this self-obsessed, self-analysis, ruminating, neurotic. I mean, you know, it's almost like a like Woody Allen kind of level of neurosis or something. It's quieted down. And then the other thing is that different parts of the brain that don't usually communicate with each other get a chance to connect. So there's a real shaking up, you know, Robin Carhart Harris calls it like a shaking up of the, of the snow globe, you know, and there's then a resettling of the snow. So the, the, all these patterns that you used to kind of go down, it's like, it's like if you were, you know, sledding down the same hill over and over, you know, Mendel Kalen talks about this analogy of like the, the sledding ruts get, get deeper, the more sleds that go down. But if there's like two feet of snow, everything's fresh, you can go down a different way, right? Yeah. So, you know, with the with the psychedelic experience being the shaking of the snow globe or the adding snow to the to the hills, um, there is a a disconnection of the default mode that goes around and around in circles and this sort of solipsistic, narcissistic, me, me, me stuff gets much quieter. And then the other parts of the brain have a chance to communicate, um, which is another reason why you can potentially um, you know, hear colors or see music or things like that is that these disparate parts of the brain that are, never get a chance to connect finally do. So the brain's really operating in, in a different mode. Um, and then there's this issue of neuroplasticity, which I am really, really interested in. And, um, it's important to know that oxytocin facilitates neuroplasticity. It facilitates learning and we learn better in group than we do individual. Like when we are isolated, we do not learn as well. There's more oxytocin in, in group cohesion and there's more learning that goes on in that, in that way. Um, I, I wrote about this originally, again, in Moody Bitches, about how 
uh, in animal studies, animals who are housed socially versus um, in solitary confinement, basically. The ones that are housed in solitary don't don't learn uh, the way that the ones that are housed in, in social housing learn. And I mean, that is uh, one of many reasons why we should not have solitary confinement in prisons is, is if we are going through the ruse of saying that they are rehabilitative, we can't put people in states where they can't learn. That doesn't make any sense. But the truth is the way that we learn best is in community, modeling desired behavior that other people can then model. Um, nobody learns well in a vacuum. Yeah, that, that was an interesting point that you brought up about in the book. And then I also saw where you mentioned that Dr. Roz Watts, she had done significant research with psilocybin and she had mentioned that the healing mechanism of psilocybin was actually that it helps you connect to oneself and others it helps restore yeah. some of these community connections and right and can you talk a little bit about how forming those community connections can help with whatever openness is achieved through these psychedelic experiences people may have well one of the things that Roz saw is that the people who got depressed again after were the ones who were going back out into situations where they didn't have good social ties, they didn't have good social support. Um, and some of the other studies are showing that group work, that group therapy with psilocybin really helps to enhance people's uh, feeling supported by a community. Like the way, the way that Roz uh, at Synthesis is doing it is that they'll have like eight people going through as a cohort. They all have psilocybin assisted therapy together as a group, but then they stay in touch afterwards. You know, and the the metaphor was sort of like they are like trees in a forest, you know, and uh, they shared a little bit of roots and their branches touch a little bit, but they're individual trees. But like, you know, they know that they are in a, that they are part of a stand of trees that really forms a community. Uh, Roz says it so much more nicely than I do. Um, but but this idea of uh, communities being sort of healing or therapeutic, this is, um, you know, the way that I wrote Good Chemistry, the first chapter is about heal connecting with the self and healing by connecting with the self. Chapter two is about connecting with another person. Chapter three is about family and the connections of family and talk a lot about oxytocin in that chapter because nursing, uh, delivery, those are all really high oxytocin states, not to mention orgasm, right? So that's where that comes in. And then uh, chapter four is about the connections that we make in community. Um, and there I talk about all sorts of things. I mean, you know, one of the things I, I, I like to talk about my own personal experiences when I can. You know, I, I definitely went through a short period of time of like going to raves and being very interested in MDMA in the context of group work. And um, this sort of feeling of like of like the murmuration of of birds, you know, that that when you when you dance with the same people on a dance floor for hours and hours, you start to sort of have this group mind experience. You you feel like the 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 people on the dance floor are sort of one organism, like a group mind. And that uh, is a really heady feeling, you know, when everybody is dancing to the same song and likes the same music and smiling and looking around. and Everybody seems like beautiful and happy. That's a really therapeutic experience to have. Um, you know, group work, uh, not only is it sort of good for the soul, but it's also incredibly cost efficient. So I really think that what we are going to be seeing over time is we're going to see more and more group work. I mean, there's already tremendous precedents, right, for group work with like ayahuasca circles or, or, you know, Ibogaine rituals with the Buiti tribe, you know, there's, there's plenty of precedent for, or large groups even, not, you know, not just ayahuasca circles, but like ayahuasca churches, you know, where the entire community um, is acts as if, a, you know, it is a church community, but they also have sacrament, you know, which is psychedelic. Um, I think we're going to be seeing more of this group work because it is, like, as I said, it's very cost efficient to run a bunch of people through at once. There's a precedent for uh, group work with MDMA from many, many years ago, where that was, you know, one of the main ways that MDMA was experienced back in the 70s and 80s was was in this kind of group work. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing I will say about groups and oxytocin, it's sort of like the uh, the evil seedy underbelly of oxytocin is as much as you may think it is about sort of bonding and trusting and connecting and, you know, hearts and flowers and unicorns. The other side of it is that it does, it is the hormone that sort of underlies with, when we decide whether somebody is in our tribe or in the other tribe, you know, and whether you're like on my team or on the opposing team. And so, um, you know, as much as I was talking about like uh, everybody dancing together at a rave and feeling that that sort of 
level of oneness. The truth is that uh, people can feel that at a Trump rally as well. You know, that, that you agree with what this person's saying. Everybody around you agrees with, with what this person is saying. And you, you feel very connected to the group. And this kind of social cohesion um, is, again, a really heady, uh, pleasurable experience for people. You know, so like when we go to sporting events, when we go to concerts, um, when we go to political rallies, you know, when we go to women's marches, um, we feel really connected and good about everybody around us. And it works both ways. Um, but the other thing is that part of what makes the group strong and what, what really reinforces the social cohesion is where do we end and the next group begins. And, you know, there's nothing that, that can sort, well, not, there's one of the things that can strengthen group cohesion is having an enemy, having a common enemy, right? So like after 9-11, the whole country comes together because we're like, oh, we got to get these guys that attacked us. You know, obviously it's not that simple. Um, it's not like we really even went after the right guys, if you ask some people. But um, but the but the bottom line is that the country did come together because we had a, quote, common enemy. Um, and now what would be great is if the country would come together and say like, oh, the common enemy is, you know, injustice and inequality. And the common enemy is, you know, hatred and greed and white supremacy. But um, unfortunately, that's not right now, at least the way it's panning out. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens moving forward, because one of the things I wrote in Good Chemistry is that psychedelics actually can make people uh, more conscious of the environment, more, um, more likely to be an environmental activist. So, and that's actually the, the chapter after uh, community is the chapter on connecting with nature. Um, in Moody Bitches, I sort of lamented about how we, uh, you know, the, the world is dying. I mean, the earth, the earth, we are sort of, how can I put this? I'm not gonna say we're killing the earth. We're damaging the earth. We know on some level that we are harming the earth and on some level that we in turn will be even more harmed than the earth is. And my husband always reminds me, he's like, you know, the earth's going to make it. It's us who aren't going to make it, you know, right. but I still, there's part of me that really honestly feels terrible for the way that we're treating the earth. And I think that I'm not alone. You know, I've gotten in touch with that. And I think that that psychedelics, and I include cannabis in this, by the way, that, that psychedelics and cannabis really help you feel more connected to nature and to the planet. Um, and psychedelics, I would also say, uh, help you feel connected to sort of the universe and the cosmos. But when you have these kind of epiphanies of how interconnected everything is, um, it does make you want to take better care of the planet. And there, there is actual research to show that people who take psilocybin mushrooms and have psychedelic mystical experiences do feel more connected to the planet and do feel more of a sense of obligation to take care of the planet. So that's good. And then the other question is, what about the political stance? Like, is it possible that if you have psychedelic transformative experiences that you're more likely to be uh, communal minded as opposed to maybe capitalist oriented. Um, I would argue that you probably are, you know, that the, the lessons that we're all getting, you know, that everything is one and we're all connected and love is the answer. And like, look at the interdependence and isn't that beautiful? Like if we're really all getting these messages, then we should all kind of be turning into, into commies to some degree and, and be more sort of socially minded um, I think we are, you know, I think that there may be a, a really gradual evolution that way, but I also think that there's this whole, the, the dinosaurs still have to die off, you know, and this old way of thinking of like, I got mine, you know, you get yours, like, you're not my problem. I'm not your keeper. You know, it's funny, like the, you know, the Christian thing is supposed to be like, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Uh, but somehow, you know, a lot of these early religious tenets have sort of gotten dis disconnected. Um, from the the finances of it all. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And it will be very interesting to see how things shape over time. Like you said, when the dinosaurs die off and more people are exposed to this, to those experiences where they have the all one feeling. Like it, it's it's a remarkable thing the first time you have that if you're brought up in a capitalist society and you're told the entire time like nope, but, you know individualism above right. all and 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 right. the almighty dollar and then all of a sudden you're like hold it i'm just like a plant or so whatever you know whatever you <laughs> everybody is my brother like whoa that is a real yeah. paradigm shift so it will be interesting to see how those play out yeah i mean i you know i was definitely brought up by you know my dad's dad died when he was very young and he was really brought up that you that you can't rely on anybody but yourself and he taught me 
from a really early age to be independent and strong and not to need anything from anybody. And I really took those lessons in and it took me a long, long time to learn how to like admit I had any needs at all, you know, but, and, and that is, a, I, I do equate that with this sort of capitalism kind of, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and no one's going to help you and you don't need to help anybody else, you know, just like dog eat dog world kind of thing, you know, but, but the, the reality is it really works better <laughs> If everybody can give to the middle, there's enough for everyone, you know, typically. I mean, you know, somebody described it as a potluck. And it's funny because I we've got a group of friends here, really good community where I live. And before COVID, we were having monthly potlucks. And everybody brings whatever the hell they want. And there's tons of food for everyone, you know. I mean, it really does kind of work out that if everybody just puts to the middle, there's often enough to share. And that that is sort of communism, you know. It's like from each according to their abilities and to each according to their needs, that's how it works in couples. That's how it works in families. It could work that way in communities. And I think, you know, I think eventually it probably will. I think, you know, Bernie was incredibly popular. Um, it's just everybody was so worried about who, who could, who had the best chance of beating Trump. But I, I was impressed actually with how many people bought into like a pretty serious kind of socialist agenda. I think a lot of us uh, and younger people are, don't think of socialism as such a bad word. Yeah, agreed. As a, I was a Bernie delegate in 2016, and I recall when he took the stage at the DNC, and there's, you know, there was like five people when he announced that he was running for president in a backyard somewhere, and then there's like he's this is this is a socialist message going out to the U.S. I was all tears, which was captured on yeah. TV. But like <laughs> it was, but it was you know it was a fantastic moment to realize there are so many people that are being opened up to these ideas, and and I think with psychedelics, hopefully that continues and we're going to use this opportunity oh did you have something more to say i'm gonna well i just one thing you know i'm i'm living in a tiny little churchy town it's very republican very churchy up where i am it's like it's north of new york city by a considerable amount and um and you know there were plenty of trump signs and a lot of republicans but the next generation down like my kid and my and his friends they've got Republican parents, but they're all like really lefty and like Bernie and, and like they, they identify as Marxists and socialists. So I'm like, and they haven't even had psychedelics yet. It's just, it's in, it's, it's in the air, you know, it's, it's in the mix um, that more of us are talking about um, equity and inclusion and um, diversity. And, you know, these things that, you know, they're not just like little buzzwords, like, you know, they really, they mean things and they signify deep change that needs to happen in our country. I talk about the early childhood wounding of America. This is something I kind of get into also um, that our country has had childhood trauma, just like we have had childhood trauma, uh, you know, founded on, on genocide and slavery. And that's like the dirty little secret that, you know, we have to really address over and over again to, to get those like deep wounds out of the body. Yeah, as a as a collective, we need to make that healing. And yeah, it, yeah, it will be very interesting to see how as the as the future generations are more open to these experiences and have a more collective mindset period, how that healing occurs. All right, we're going to use this as a transition. So everybody, this is the end of week one. Listen to, to week two. Uh- <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to the Plant Medicine Podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating or review. It helps other people find the show. And if you'd like to find out more about plant medicine, including the show notes from today's episode, please head over to plantmedicine.org. The music for the Plant Medicine Podcast is by the incredible Porangi. If you'd like to check out his music, please find him at porangi.com or on social media at P-O-R-A-N-G-U-I.